Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this session of the Global Security Forum in the panel, Can a U.S.-Iran Deal Work? I'm John Alterman. I'm the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy here at CSIS and also the Director of the Middle East Program. Uh, I don't think this topic needs much introduction because it is clearly a topic on people's minds. A Pew poll about a year ago said 70 percent of Americans consider the Iranian nuclear program a direct threat to the United States. And now we seem to be entering a period where there's a possibility, a possibility of some sort of negotiated solution. There are people who are optimistic, people who are skeptical about what a negotiated deal would look like. And what we're here to talk about today is whether a negotiation, not whether it will work, but whether it could work. And as I was putting together this panel, I thought of my dream team of panelists I'm happy to say that's who you're seeing today. Three people who I think are not only uh, experienced, wise uh, observers, but also people who I'm happy to call friends. Uh, to my immediate right, to your left, Hala Esfandiari. Hala has been the director of the Middle East program at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars uh, since 1997. Eight. 98, okay, not quite as long a run. Before that, from 95 to 96, she was a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. She was a fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy in the first year of its fellowship program in 1995. Prior to that, she taught Persian language, contemporary Persian literature, and courses on the woman, women's movement in Iran at Princeton University from 1980 to 94. Before leaving Iran, she served as the Deputy Secretary General of the Women's Organization of Iran worked as a journalist, including for the paper mm -hmm. Kehan, under a somewhat different yeah. editorial policy, and she taught at the yeah. College of Mass Communications. Her most recent book, My Prison, My Home, uh, four years ago was based on her arrest by the Iranian security authorities in 2007, after which she spent 105 days in solitary confinement. It's a great book, and I'm, I thank you for writing, and I thank you for being on this panel. Next is my, my former partner in crime, Bob Einhorn. Bob is a senior fellow of the Arms Control Initiative in the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence at Brookings. Uh, before coming to Brookings in May, he served as the State Department Special Advisor for Nonproliferation and Arms Control. He has worked the Iran issue on the technical side for the last four years, like few other people in the world. Between 2001 and 2009, uh, and what I think we'd agree is the highlight of your career, Bob was the senior advisor here at CSIS, where he directed our non-proliferation prevention, our proliferation prevention program. And before coming, he was secretary, assistant secretary of state for non-proliferation, deputy assistant secretary of state for political military affairs, and a member of the policy planning staff. At the very end, Al Hunt, many of you know him from his show, Political Capital with Al Hunt on Bloomberg Television, or from any of the analysis and debate shows that have aired in Washington for the last several decades. Uh, he writes a column for Bloomberg View. It also appears in the International New York Times, which used to be the International Herald Tribune. Prior to joining Bloomberg in 2005, he spent four decades at the Wall Street Journal, where he was congressional and national political reporter, bureau chief, executive Washington editor, and for 11 years wrote a weekly column, Politics and People. He also directed the journal's political polls for 20 years, served as president of the Dow Jones Newspaper Fund, and was a board member of Ottawa Community Newspapers. Now, what is most remarkable about this entire panel is I could easily have had all of their spouses and had a spectacular panel as well. <laughs> Al is married to Shul Bakash. Bob is, of course, married to Jessica Einhorn. Al is married to Judy Woodruff, all spectacular people. If I couldn't have my Dream Team panel, I would have taken my spouses <laughs> of the Dream Team panel and done very much as well. So thank you. Um, and thank you very much for being here. I think the question to start with is when you say, can a deal work, what does working look like from each perspective? What does working look like from an Iranian perspective? What does it look like from a, a US administration perspective? What are the views in Congress about what working looks like? Why don't we start with Hala? Uh, from an <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for having me and not my spouse. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so that, um, although he would have been much better than me. But from, from an Iranian uh, perspective, um, a deal will, an ideal deal would be a deal that will lead to lifting the sanctions. But Iran, the Iranians being realists, know that this is a process, and it's a step-by-step -step process. Mm -hmm. So they are willing probably to make some concessions, hoping that the P5 plus one will in return make also some concession. And what they have put this time on the table is a serious proposal whether it's acceptable to the P5 plus one, we just have to wait and see what will happen in the next round of negotiations. While until recently, the approach was that everything can be dealt very fastly. Now they are talking about the long term and step by step. So, and we'll talk uh, in a little while about the extent to which lifting yeah. sanctions, about lifting U.S. sanctions, lifting the international sanctions. But from an Iranian perspective, the goal is somehow to escape from the financial pressure that yes. Iran's been under as a consequence of its nuclear program. Definitely. I mean, we know that the sanctions have had really a back-breaking effect on the Iranian economy, on the everyday life of the uh, Iranian people and uh, the goal of the government is that at the end of this negotiation or maybe halfway through the negotiation, the banking sanctions and the oil sanctions can be lifted so that Iran will have access to its uh, uh, money which is now right. it's not accessible uh, to them and would be able once again to raise the amount of uh, oil exports, which is now uh, almost by half. Right, we're gonna come back to that. Bob, what's a successful successful deal look like? Uh, first of all, John, it's, it's uh, great to be back at CSAS. I see you've had an upgrade uh, since I was, uh, I was last there. Uh, what, what constitutes success for the U.S.? Um, I think success is when Iran accepts the kind of rigorous constraints on its nuclear program uh, that gives the U.S. and the world confidence that it can convert its nuclear program quickly uh, into a nuclear weapons program. Uh, specifically, uh, success is constraining Iran's so-called breakout capability. Breakout capability is when uh, Iran is able to uh, suddenly uh, renounce constraints, kick out inspectors, and quickly produce enough fissile material uh, for one or more nuclear weapons before uh, the world has an opportunity to react, including by the use of military force. Uh, so the objective is to uh, lengthen this breakout timeline so that it's possible for the International Atomic Energy Agency to detect so-called breakout right away and have plenty of time uh, to take effective action uh, before Iran could have nuclear weapons. And constraining that breakout capability means uh, limiting uh, Iran's uh, uh, programs, especially its enrichment program, if one is allowed in an agreement, and I think it's inevitable that a domestic enrichment program will be allowed in an agreement, uh, as well as to uh, prevent Iran from using this uh, reactor at Iraq, uh, this heavy water uh, plutonium production reactor, uh, to produce plutonium. And it also means uh, uh, putting in place very effective monitoring measures uh, to make sure that Iran cannot have a covert program. Uh, Iran has experience in building a number of facilities secretly. They were discovered, uh, but you have to guard against the possibility that they will try to have a covert program again. Uh, and you have to have measures in place at the declared uh, Iranian nuclear facilities so that any attempt at breakout can be detected right away, instantly, the day, the day that it happens. So the status quo would represent a failure. That is, unless you're able to actually lengthen the window for breakout, unless you have greater transparency, all those things would represent, you, you can't say, well, they haven't exploded, or they haven't tested a device, so the process is working. Instead, 
you have to say we have not been able to lengthen that period so the process is failed. Yeah. The current breakout period, in my view, is not acceptable. It has to be shortened considerably. Uh, and if we didn't get an agreement soon uh, and Iran could enhance its capabilities over the next three to six months, it would have a much shorter breakout capability. So in my view, the sooner that we can get constraints on Iran's program, the better. Al, Capitol Hill has a lot of power. People have paid a lot of attention looking at this issue. What are the different definitions of success that you hear when you talk to people on the Hill? <clears throat> that assumes it's a rational institution to begin with, John. I, <clears throat> first of all, I, I too appreciate and I'm honored to be here. When John was putting together this panel, he, he got a lead and he got Bob and he said, uh, we have to balance this panel out. Let's turn to old Hunch. So we have, I'm, I'm going to talk about the political hacks. That's my, uh, that's my specialty. Um, you can't talk about a Congress today in this context, this issue, the same way you would have talked about a Congress, say, 25 years ago. If I, I think Bob Einhorn has written a brilliant paper that really outlines what a final deal will, will look like or something close to that. And if you take that premise, if you had George Mitchell and Howard Baker and Richard Lugar and John Kerry running the Senate, then I think you could see how it would not be hard to come to some kind of resolution. It's much harder today to, to, to resolve anything. And I think there are two conundrums to start with which affect Congress. One is we ask, can, can Rouhani deliver? Uh, what's the politics over there? And I, I suspect that they must ask, can Obama deliver? And that's where you get to Congress. And I think the second conundrum in the context here is, is Syria. The administration basically thinks that Syria is a, is a sort of roadmap of sorts for how you achieve things. On Capitol Hill, Republicans and a few Democrats think Syria was a botched disaster. Whether it was or whether it's not, they, they talk different languages there. It seems to me that if they come to Congress, and as Bob can uh, talk about with far greater expertise than I do, they can administratively waive a lot of <clears throat> these waivers, and they can decide they want to try to bypass Congress. The optics, the politics, everything's pretty bad about that, and, and I, it's probably not the way they're going to go. I think there are three issues that then come to the forefront. Number one, what will be the Israeli reaction? What will be the real reaction? I assume Netanyahu will oppose anything, but what will the Israeli security apparatus, what will, how will they feel? Can they say this really is in the, in the security interest? Because the fact of the matter is that the that concerns about Israel are paramount on Capitol Hill uh, in both parties, much more so than used to be the case. Uh, I think a second question is, uh, which Bob alluded to a moment ago, is what kind of inspections what kind of verifications do we have? How intrusive are they? Do we have validators who say they really work as the IAEA signed on to it? And the third thing comes to Obama. And what Obama at some point is going to have to do is not only say this is in the security interest of the United States, but he's going to have to say this is the choice. The choice is this or war. And this is a very war-weary nation. Uh, I think people are, that poll you cited earlier, I agree. Uh, most people are very suspicious of the Iranians. I think most people are very supportive uh, of an, uh, an Israeli position. But as we saw in the case of Syria, uh, this is an incredibly war-weary country. And I'm not sure that Obama can frame that as well as we once thought he could. But it will be incumbent upon him to do so. Bob, as we go through a process, and what the administration is talking about is a, a temporary uh, agreement or an interim agreement with somewhat modified uh, sanctions relief, probably allowing the trade in precious metals and petrochemicals, it's something very incremental. That was certainly the Almaty offer. And they say we're going for a six month targeted negotiation. How well will people in the public, people on Capitol Hill, be able to judge? whether the Iranians are adhering to their obligations, or will we be in the same, you can't disprove a negative, is you don't know what you don't know. How clean is that debate going to be? You're picking up on what else. I think it's going to be pretty clean, uh, because for uh, most of the uh, things we would want the Iranians to do in this kind of interim deal, uh, are things that the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, can monitor very precisely. Um, there are things like uh, making sure this uh, nuclear reactor at Iraq uh, has not been loaded, that fuel hasn't been you know, transferred to the site, 
Uh, it means uh, perhaps uh, ensuring that uh, enrichment is ta not taking place uh, at more, at, you know, at the Fordow facility or certainly not uh, enhanced enrichment at the Fordow facility. Uh, that the uh, Iranians have not installed more advanced centrifuges at one of their enrichment facilities. So these are the kinds of things that the IEA is very good at, uh, at monitoring and reporting to its members about. So I think we could have high confidence uh, that such an arrangement is being kept. What, the one thing that is hard to monitor um, uh, is uh, whether there are covert facilities. Uh, I don't think anyone believes that there are covert facilities of any substantial size today. But over time, in a final agreement, you, you would be concerned about that. But under a final agreement, you'd probably have much more uh, extensive verification measures than you would have in place for an interim arrangement. Who in, in Iran? would be opposed either to getting an initial interim agreement or to getting a more comprehensive final agreement, like Bob suggested? Uh, there is a faction among the hardliners. There is a faction among the revolutionary guards who are opposed to such an agreement, whether it's step one or the comprehensive agreement. We know that <clears throat> the IAEA has been wishing or pushing for Iran joining the, um, additional, the, protocol. the additional protocol, but the Iranian parliament has made it clear that this is not doable until we have a final agreement. So you have elements in <coughs> parliament, elements among the revolution regards, and elements among the hardliners. And the reason why I think the Supreme Leader came out two days ago and supported the negotiation team was precisely to at least silence some of these opposition who were talking about a sellout. I mean, they said they were arguing that the reason why the negotiations were kept confidential is that the negotiators, especially the foreign minister Zarif, was selling out Iran's interest. So the Supreme Leader came out and said the negotiators are our children and the children of the revolution. We have to trust them and they have a free hand. Although he added, I don't trust the United States and many other things. So yes, there will be opposition, but if the government is going to be able to put something tangible, which is acceptable as a first step for the Iranian government. I think uh, they will, the people will go along, and the hardliners reluctantly will be forced to go along. And, and you know, one of the, the criticisms of Iranian negotiating behavior has been that the negotiations always get dragged out, that the negotiations are never over, that there's always revisiting. There seems to be a sense of urgency among some of the negotiators, mm -hmm. but do you think there's a possibility that, that there'll be a faction that wants to move ahead and conclude an interim agreement, and there'll be a faction that said, no, we can, get, we can do better, and you can't appear too eager, and it's not about the principle, it's about the timing. Yeah. John, I don't think so. I think until uh, Jalili, the last negotiator, was in charge, he was a master of dragging out everything. And we were told that every time the two sides sat, sat together, we started going back to history and uh, putting on the table all our grievances. This time, Zarif said, the past is the past. We are going to start today. So my sense is that even if there are people in Iran who want to drag it out among the hardliners, they won't succeed because they are now a bunch of technocrats who are there who are going to carry on with the negotiation unless, you know, and also a very important decision was taken to move the nuclear file from the uh, Supreme National Council to the foreign ministry so that Zarif will report to the president who was a nuclear negotiator himself directly rather than going through the, uh, uh, Iran's national guards. Al, could you see a, 
a sort of a tacit alliance emerging between skeptics on the Iranian side and skeptics on the American side, where each one reads the other's signals and they try to derail from their own side some sort of agreement because of a sense that, that, that each one feels their side is giving away too much. Yes, I think you already see that. Part of the efforts to toughen the sanctions right now, which is there is some move in the Senate, I don't think it'll ha occur. I, I think it'll be blocked. But I think in part, that's, uh, that's the motive of some. And surely, if there's any kind of an agreement, an interim agreement or a eventual agreement, there will be ferocious opposition. Some of it will be from people who probably genuinely think it's a bad idea. Some who would oppose anything that uh, Obama put up the Magna Carta, they would oppose it. Uh, and, um, and, and, and so that clearly will be the case. I think, John, in many, in, in many respects, the more interesting question is, who are the people that could facilitate it and make it happen uh, if, if there would be some kind, of a, um, some kind of a deal? In the House, that's a hard question to answer. It's a very hard question to answer. It would have to be the House Republican leadership, which is a thin read. In the Senate, I think the, the two key people not because of their positions, but just because of where they've been. One would be Corker, who I think is a Luger in the making. He does not want to just oppose. He doesn't fall in that category of Republicans I spoke about earlier. And the other is Menendez, uh, not the most respected chairman we've ever had in the Foreign Relations Committee, but he's been a hawk, as was noted earlier. And if he were to continue that posture, I think it would complicate matters a great deal. Um, we focused a lot on the, the sort of US politics side, but it seems to me that the part of the question from an Iranian side is not only the US sanctions, but the broader international coalition that has gathered to support the US position. And certainly one of the possibilities would be the, the United States, for political reasons or others, would seem to be extreme. And some of the more multilateral pieces of a sanctioned regime could fall away. In, Ar in Iranian political terms, would that be perceived as a win? Would it be acceptable if they got through an interim agreement, couldn't get an international agreement, but the US was blamed for the failure of the international agreement? Is that a possible win from the Iranian side? Rhetorically, yes, unless the European break away from the P5 plus one and start dealing with the Iranian uh, you know, directly. But at the end of the day, the Iranians know that they have to come to an agreement with the United States. And without an agreement with the US, this will not work for them. That's, that's the Iranian position. They know that. You know. But you, so you don't think there's uh, an instinct for, for coalition busting? Well, they will do. I mean, at this stage, they are hoping that will, they will come to some end to some kind of an agreement with the P5 plus one. But if they don't succeed, I'm sure they will try focusing on the European and they will try and create a wedge, definitely. Uh, I agree with Hala. I mean, a, a big win for Iran uh, is to divide the P5 plus one, uh, shatter the international sanctions coalition, uh, and get the lifting of sanctions without having to pay any pay the cost of constraints on the nuclear program through an agreement. So, you know, sanctions lifting without agreement is the best outcome. I think the current team uh, in Iran, the negotiating team, is realistic enough to know uh, that they really have to have an agreement to get the sanctions lifted. Uh, but uh, if uh, negotiations are prolonged and become difficult, it, it could be that the Iranians would resort you know, to the tactic of trying to get the sanctions lifted without an agreement by trying to demonstrate that they're the reasonable side, uh, that the P5 plus one have been intransigent, have asked for too much, unreasonable demands, uh, and so it's not their fault. Um, and uh, I don't know if that would have much appeal. Uh, I'm sure the U.S. administration and its P5 plus one partners would try to counteract that, uh, that tactic uh, by demonstrating that they have you know, tried very hard to reach a compromise. Although or they, or I think what, what Al suggested was that where Congress is, is not necessarily supporting a, a sort of we're being the reasonable side. And there's a P5 plus one negotiating position, but to the extent that there are congressional spoilers, that could make it 
more complex. I think that's one of the downsides of you know, piling on new draconian sanctions at, at this time. Uh, we will look like we're the intransigent side, that, we, we, that the U.S. is sabotaging an agreement and, uh, and uh, is responsible for a stalemate. And I think that's really one of the problems of, of piling on with new sanctions. Yeah, and th this is precisely the argument that John Kerry's been making to his former colleagues over the last couple of weeks, that the, that the, uh, that the, that the coalition uh, for sanctions is, is, is already fraying a bit, and that if the United States is seen as the, as the real unreasonable hardliner, uh, it's going to create, it's going to make it much harder to get the kind of deal uh, that you want. And that's why they, among other things, as Bob said, think, the, think toughening the sanctions now would be bad. But in an, over, in an overview sense, uh, this, is the, this is the message that he repeats. How does that play on Capitol Hill when you talk about the need for multilateral support for sanctions? I mean, is that something where people say what is making this work is that their solidarity or people saying what makes this work is American leadership, we're gonna tighten the screws and tighten, tighten, and everybody has to follow us because we're, we're who we are. John, the, your question supposes that Congress is a homogeneous institution. No, 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 no. And no, but I mean, when you make that case to Ted Cruz, it's probably gonna get a different reaction than if you make that case to Senator Corker. Uh, I, I, I think it's a persuasive case. I, I actually think some of the so-called hawks, the Lindsey Grahams of the world, are, are, are open to conversations and open to considerations on this. Uh, so I, 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 think, I think that is an argument that does not, is not automatically rejected by some of those people. I think it goes back to what I said earlier, some arguments are gonna be rejected by elements on Capitol Hill no matter how persuasive or how rational they might be. And you, you mentioned earlier the sort of politics around waivers. We currently have four more sanctions laws, they are in place until the end of 2016. If the administration move forward with waivers, either as part of an interim agreement or, or as part of a, a final agreement, if the administration, there's an article in the National Journal today that suggested um, that the administration might not enforce provisions of the law, especially actively, how, what are the kinds of reactions that would arouse on this, on, on Iran as an issue. I'm sorry, that would arouse what? What kind of, if, if the administration tried to, to either right. officially waive or implicitly waive uh, aspects of current legislation or I, current law? I think, John, it depends on the context. If it's done where there, whether it's an interim or a final agreement where there is a consensus among a lot of people, uh, including some of the people we talked to earlier, that this is, a, this is not, the perfect deal, but it's a good deal. Uh, if it's a deal that could get through the Senate, but the House says no way, I mean, we're almost back to looking at Syria as a model of sorts, then I think probably they could do it. Short of that, however, I think it's not just the optics, I think the politics of it become very difficult. And the administration, in a way, I hate to keep talking about Syria because I know how different the issues are, but in a way they complicated their ability to do that by making the decision to go to Congress and talking about the importance of congressional authority on an issue as important as it may be uh, isn't, isn't, doesn't rise to the level of this issue. So I, I, I think it's not an easy question to answer, and I have proven that by eluding uh, an easy answer, but I, but I do think it's complicated. Bob, you, your paper that, that uh, we're going to plug again, that I'll <laughs> refer to, uh, you delivered in Israel uh, a couple weeks ago, um, was premised on the idea that, that the deal might not be great, but it's better than sanctions falling apart, and it's better than what war would give you, um, both in terms of, of the sort of international coalition, but also in terms of what the Iranians do. What are the, who are the kinds of people who are very skeptical about that argument? I'm sure that, that it has not found favor in every corner. And, and, and what do you think would persuade people that, you know, that really is kind of the best, the best thing? Um, I'm not sure what will persuade them. If anything, will persuade some of them. Um, but um, look, you just have to compare this deal to the alternatives and, and look realistically at the alternatives. Um, you know, military option, what, what will that do? Um, will, will it um, really set back Iran's nuclear program and for how long? Some estimates are as short as six months, eight months. Is it, is it worth 
the risk of uh, triggering, triggering a major regional conflict. Um, you know, and I think the, the worst consequence of uh, a military attack is that uh, Iran could then decide to kick out the inspectors and go for nuclear weapons. And much of the world would sympathize with them, and the sanctions coalition would shatter. So the military option doesn't look all that very good. good. Uh, others think uh, maybe we should really push hard for regime change. And if we really did that, uh, we'd have a better regime. Maybe they'd give up nuclear weapons. Problem is that uh, a new regime in Iran uh, may not want to give up a nuclear weapons capability. Um, and uh, I think you know, we've learned that it's not so easy from the outside to change a regime. That you know, if there's going to be a major change in Iran, it's going to come from inside Iran. And in any event, if it's going to come, it's not going to come on any time frame that's relevant to dealing with the nuclear issue. So I think when you compare you know, what I think is a, a good enough deal against the alternatives, uh, it doesn't look, uh, it doesn't look uh, bad at all. Is it good enough? I mean, I'm wondering about the, you know, is it good enough? The Israeli Defense Minister, Moshe Yalon, uh, October 24th, uh, sharply attacked the U.S. leadership without mentioning it, said, we're saying beware. To the Western leaders, we say, don't be seduced by the Iranian charm offensive. Don't be tempted to ease the sanctions before you have a clear result in your hands, clear proof that Iran has no nuclear capability, no military nuclear capability, no uranium enrichment capability or anything else. We're warning you because we are seeing indications from the West to the effect that, oh, they're talking nice now. There's been a change in Iran. Let's go meet them halfway. There is talk of confidence building measures of answering calls for humanitarian aid. That's exactly what the Iranians want, a reduction of sanctions before they've stopped their military nuclear project. True, little Israel should not be the spearhead, and we always try not to be. But when no one speaks the facts as they are, we have to speak them. We have to speak very clearly so that naivete or wishful thinking do not influence policy. Are, are you persuaded that when, assuming we get to an interim agreement, when we get to a final agreement, Moshe Yalon will say, good enough really is good enough? I'm not, I'm not persuaded he's going to say that. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think you, one has to be realistic about what's achievable. Uh, the conditions that Netanyahu has laid down for an acceptable agreement, sure, they would be great. It would be terrific if we could get that agreement. You know, the end of their enrichment program, all enriched uranium sent out of the country, dismantle their critical facilities, all the rest of it. That would be wonderful. They, but uh, no one I know who understands the uh, domestic situation in Iran believes that that's an achievable uh, outcome. Uh, it just uh, it just isn't. I mean, if you, uh, I think Hala is right that the supreme leader can, if he believes it's a good deal, I think he can get it through. Uh, but uh, he won't be able to get through a deal uh, if it doesn't uh, if if it doesn't embody what the Iranian leadership has called its rights, its inalienable nuclear rights, uh, and that means the right to pursue programs like enrichment. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it's simply not negotiable to try to get the maximalist positions that some, including uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, have advocated. First, uh, may, I, may I ask one question? Um, I, I, am, I talked to a couple um, um, members of Congress the last couple of days who I think would like to support a, any kind of a reasonable deal. And one of the questions that they, they keep posing is that what, what, what sends off bad vibrations to them is they say, why are the Iranians saying they're going to build 34 new nuclear uh, plants when they, they're sitting on the world's what, second largest supply of natural gas? I think that's the sort of signal that Congress, maybe it has no relevance at all to the substance here, but that's the sort of thing that, that, that creates more political complications. And I don't know what the answer to that is. You want to talk about the, the energy needs of Iran? <laughs> we like talking, sure. Um, for the Iranian, the, you have to look forward because your microphone. Okay. Forward. For the Iranian, the nuclear program actually started before the revolution, so it's not the child of the revolution. It, start, it existed there, and I think the most unfortunate uh, thing that happened was that the Germans were building the Boucher reactor, but after the revolution, under the pressure, I believe, of the United States, and I'm quoting Zarif, who said that at the Wilson Center, the Germans left and the Russians took over, but the Russians were very 
uh, clever, they dragged it out for 28 or 30 years and then finally delivered uh, the Boucher facilities, which are basically still not uh, working. For Iran, it has become a matter of pride because it is an indigenous program, number one. And number two, I think when they went down this road, they believe, and I'm not, not talking about the weaponization. We assume that they are not going down that road. But they wanted to have a nuclear energy, and I felt it is their right to be able to have access to uh, nuclear energy. And now they have, the, and it's, uh, to have access to this is a matter of consensus among most Iranians, even the Iranians who are opposed to the regime and the, the in, are in the diaspora, believe that Iran has the right to uh, look the nuclear energy for peaceful uh, purposes. But they have made also certain, you know, as uh, Bob said, they are not going to give up completely you know, um, enrichment, they are not going to, uh, they don't trust any country probably to send out their 20% stockpile. I mean, this is the big problem. I mean, who can you trust as far as they are concerned? So, and uh, they have made it clear that they will not join the additional protocol unless they have something substantial in return. In addition, which they have gas yeah. shortages and sure. gas is an important natural yeah. gas is yeah, an important sir. source of, of imports for currency i i think their or exports i'm sorry i think their nuclear energy program started out as a nuclear weapons program that was the rationale for it that was the justification i mean it wasn't just they, they wanted nuclear weapons they wanted them under the shah i think after the revolution temporarily they gave up <laughs> nuclear weapons ambitions but they were resurrected again in the uh, early mid uh, 1980s during the iraq iran war uh, and it's not surprising that they were interested in nuclear weapons then uh, fighting a terrible bloody war with the, with iraq uh, iraq was assumed to have a nuclear weapons capability of their own i think it started out as a nuclear weapons program in their enrichment program uh, what they found out it, is that it wasn't too easy to hide a nuclear weapons program. And two of their major facilities were outed by uh, either the MEK or Western intelligence, and they paid a heavy cost for being caught essentially cheating on their obligations. Uh, we have good information that in 2003, a decision was made uh, to suspend one of the elements of their nuclear weapons program, the weaponization part, actually constructing the device. Uh, and uh, there is also pretty good information uh, that uh, the leader uh, has not given a green light to proponents of nuclear weaponization to go forward and cross the nuclear threshold. And I think that's where we are today, a nuclear weapons program in suspended animation, just being deferred. And I think uh, what, what we need to do uh, is to make sure um, that that program is backed as far as possible away from the nuclear threshold and that moving back toward that nuclear threshold can be easily detected and we can react to it very quickly. I think that's the theory of success. So one of the other pieces of this puzzle is that Iran has a long list of grievances in the way the world has treated Iran and, and shown disrespect to Iran. And the nuclear program, for better or worse, has been the tool Iran has used to get the world's attention to get the world to come to the table. Does there come a point where some people in Iran say we can't give away the nuclear program and only work on narrow aspects of sanctions? If we're going to give up the nuclear program, we have to have a broader agenda. We have to, to right Iran's place in the region rather than, than just work out from under this, the smallest of economic things. Are there people who say it? Where are they? What kind of voice would they have? Sure. There are people in the Iranian administration who believe that Iran has to play an important geopolitical role in the region. This has been done. But I think what this administration in Iran is doing is trying to separate at this point. This presidential administration. You mean President Rouhani and his administration 
to separate the nuclear portfolio from the rest of Iran's concerns and the role Iran wants to play. Recently, Zarif said, if we are invited to sit at the table during the Syrian negotiation, we will welcome it and go. But he, he didn't say, it is our right to be there. He said, if we are invited, we are going. So I think they would like to focus at this stage only on the nuclear program, hoping that because of the, if they can get some sort of an agreement, the sanctions will be lifted, and then they will start dealing with other issues. But, but that don't. represents that faction in sure. the government, and it doesn't represent necessarily the leaders thinking about where the nuclear program fits in, and it doesn't necessarily address what the leader may think about the role of the nuclear program as a tool, as an instrument, uh, to, to resolve a whole range of grievances about Iran's place in the world. That's just President Rouhani. Yeah, but, but uh, John, President Rouhani doesn't speak in a vacuum. President Rouhani speaks now for a faction in the Iranian establishment, and so far he has the support of the Supreme Leader. How long this will last, we don't know. But so far he has the support of the Supreme Leader, and he believes that if he can deliver, if he can deliver uh, some kind of an agreement on the nuclear issue and the sanctions will be lifted, then he can, he's going to become much more powerful and can deal with the opposition inside Iran and deal with other issues. At this stage, he has abdicated some of his power to the security institutions. He doesn't deal with them, with what they do. You know, I think he's waiting for a later stage. That's why it's important both for the Iranian and I think it's a unique chance for the P5 plus one maybe to come some, to some sort of an agreement. But as Bob said, it has to be under very intrusive and uh, exact verification and also, uh, you know, inspections. But, but I think then there's a, there's a, I think a fear on the Iranian side, a fear on the U.S. side that this thing would turn into a Christmas tree, that everybody would try to hang things from it because they see this being the best opportunity to affect bilateral relations. And, and Al, as you look at the Hill, would there be some effort to say, well, if we're going to do anything for the Iranians on nuclear stuff, we can't have a clean nuclear issue because we are concerned with all of the aspects of Iranian regional behavior, be it support for Hamas and Hezbollah, activities in Syria, support for Islamic Jihad, so on, so on, so on. Is that, does that, do you think that impulse would come in, on the Hill and what, what would happen if, if the administration needed, le needed actual legislation rather than just push for a waiver? Well, there's no question that impulse would come. It would come among other, some people who just feel passionately about some of those issues uh, and it would come from those people who would want to sandbag anything that, uh, that, that is sent up to the Hill. Uh, Whatever happens, there's one thing that I think we all can guarantee. It will be messy, it will be unattractive, it will be complex, it will be difficult. Uh, and I, I, I want to just go back to one thing I said earlier, though. In, 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 in America, it is not, this is, the stakes are huge here. Public opinion is not irrelevant. And when we talk about congressional opinion, that also is affected by particularly those people on the, on the margins of this. You might be able to predict how 80% of the people up there will react but those people in the margins will be affected by public opinion. And I think there's two issues that we have to keep in mind. Number one is that this is an incredibly war-weary war country. I don't care where it is. This is a country that does not want another war uh, of, of, of any sort. And secondly, the, the, the sort of counter to that, um, I think the president has lost a lot of credibility in recent months and has shown um, an inability to be as persuasive as we once thought he was. And if he can't recapture that, I think that's going to create problems. How does that perception affect the president's ability to negotiate with the Iranians in your judgment? 
Well, I'm not sure, that, well, it, it affects it in the sense that, that if it eventually has to go into the political arena, that has to be a consideration. I'm not sure that the, first of all, I don't think the administration would accept my premise. Uh, so therefore it wouldn't affect it that much. Uh, but, 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 but I think that uh, certainly there's gonna be a, uh, you know, a question raised. In, in the end, any interim or any final agreement is gonna be made by the President of the United States, subject to congressional approval perhaps. And how he presents that and how effective he is in persuading people this is in the security interest of the United States, security interest of Israel. And as Bob said, it's not perfect, but it's good. Uh, and his ability to persuade people of that is, is, is very relevant to this. And Bob, and I, am I correct in, in, in getting from your comments that the president doesn't necessarily need to get uh, clear congressional approval that this is principally a multilateral agreement which Congress doesn't have to approve and Congress doesn't have to be a party to. I mean, they have to approve it in a certain sense. They're going to have to um, uh, agree uh, ultimately to uh, repeal some of the sanctions that are on the books. They're going to have to cast votes on that. They're going to have to uh, cast votes for funding some of the arrangements that, um, that come out of the deal. Uh, but whether they'll have to pro approve the deal itself is, is unclear. Um, whether it would be um, a kind of uh, action taken by the executive uh, that doesn't require, uh, you know, even support of both houses of Congress, not to mention a treaty, is not, I don't know that it's been determined at this point. The timing of an agreement is unpredictable. There's a sense of Iranian, or people, I think the negotiators perceive the Iranians feel an urgency to make a deal. Um, but let's say we sort of get kind of a partial interim something. Is there any point at which we should say, you know what, we shouldn't try negotiating this, that either Rouhani's not serious, Rouhani doesn't have the juice to make the final deal, the Iranians are playing an elaborate game, and it's not really leading to a conclusion. Can you conceive of a point where we would say, we're not gonna negotiate this at all? And what would the indicators of reaching that point be? Can I, uh, during the last Iranian administration, uh, when uh, uh, Saeed Jalili was negotiator. Uh, in January uh, uh, 2011, at, at an Istanbul meeting, uh, the Iranians took the position that they were not prepared to talk substance with us until uh, the P5 plus one explicitly recognized the right to enrich uranium and immediately lifted all sanctions. Even the Russians and Chinese essentially threw their hands up and said, this is not serious, this is ridiculous. And uh, in effect, we called off negotiations at that point. We didn't resume them for over a year. Uh, and uh, you know, I, can, I think that would, would be what would happen if we uh, discovered that the Iranians really weren't, in the end of the day, serious, their, their, their actions didn't match their moderate rhetoric. Uh, you know, then I think the recourse would be to suspend negotiations um, and to uh, seek a ratcheting up of the sanctions and to uh, use uh, uh, Iran's uh, stubborn behavior at the negotiating table to seek international support for a ratcheting up of sanctions. We wouldn't have to work very hard with the U.S. Congress to get the U.S. Congress also to, to strengthen the sanctions. I think that would be the recourse. I don't anticipate that happening, frankly. Um, I think so far the Iranians have uh, seemed to be very serious about reaching an early agreement um, but um, you know, if it you know if, if if it turned out that at the end of the day they weren't prepared to accept the kinds of constraints that would make a deal acceptable to us, I can imagine simply suspending the talks and going uh, resuming the pressure strategy. And that would either lead to more crippling sanctions that would really try to either bring down the government or a military option in your view. Well, it, it, you know. In part, it would depend on how the international community perceived it. If they thought that uh, we were being overly demanding and uh, we were causing an impasse, I think it could lead to an unraveling of the sanctions. And if we used uh, military force in those circumstances, uh, it might not be seen as uh, legitimate. And it would we'd generate a lot of sympathy for the Iranians. So it'd be dependent, it would depend on how it was perceived at the time. Paula, 
Mehdi Khalaji has pointed out that, that a lot of Iranian presidents have come in uh, with energy and, and a positive attitude and sense that here they really have a chance to, to lead things in the right direction. At the end of their second term, they leave in disgrace, realizing that they actually didn't have uh, a fraction of the power they had hoped. You seem to think that Hassan Rouhani is in a different position. Why, why is that? Um, if Hassan, if Rouhani is smart, he would have watched every president before him and would always remember that the supreme leader cooperates and supports the president in the first term. But if that president does not deliver, then in the second term, he starts withdrawing his support and they live in the disgrace or whatever. Um, and I think because he's an insider, because for 30 years he has been sitting there and watching how the Ir Iranian politics has evolved, he will try and, be, and uh, will give them a sense of urgency that we need to settle this problem. But if he does not, and his success depends also on how much the P5 plus one is willing to give to Iran. It's not a one-sided road. I mean, they have to make concessions, but the other side has to also make some concession. But if these concessions are acceptable for the Supreme Leader, I think he will continue supporting Rouhani. If not, then Rouhani will have the fate of all the other presidents before him. Al, you've talked about the war weariness, I think about four times. Is there a way for this to come out on the Hill where there's something other than just a sort of grudging acceptance? Is there a way for this to unfold where people feel they've actually gotten something, they've, they've improved the security of the world, um, and, and we should take it as a win and move on? Yeah, but that's going to be very hard. I think, I, I suppose the scenario would come close to what you laid out in that, in that paper, and it would, uh, you know, perhaps it would be accompanied by some kind of authorization for force if they, if they cheat. Uh, maybe that'll give, give, give most factions what they want. Uh, I think, again, it would, it would certainly be predicated upon uh, the Israelis, at least not vehemently, uh, objecting or Netanyahu not vehemently objecting. Uh, I think it's possible to see that. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to bet a great deal on it. And Bob, you think that at the end of the day, the the center of Israeli public opinion will say, even if it's imperfect, it's realistic. It's the best we could do, and we can live with it. Is that? I think so. I mean, um, you know, Israel. Israelis have been very realistic. They, have to, they live on a narrow security margin, and they, they haven't had the luxury of being able to see the world in ideological terms. And I think they'll take a look at the situation at the time. Uh, they s will see uh, how much support there might be for the use of force, the downsides of it, and they'll make their calculation. And I think if the deal is, you know, is, is credible, uh, I think they'll go, they'll go along with it. I think it's essential. They don't have to be enthusiastic about it, but they just have to um, uh, not uh, stimulate you know, their supporters on Capitol Hill to go after it. Because if they, if they do, that's going to make life very difficult for the administration. But if they don't, if they're prepared to live with it, then I think it's going to be possible to get sufficient support on the Hill. Does the view or reaction of any of the other Gulf states matter? My sense is, you know, and John, you know more, as much about this as, as anyone, um, you know, the, the, the current difficulties we're having with the Saudis, you know, are a problem. Um, but uh, I think if the Israelis are okay and are prepared to go along with the deal, um, I think, uh, you know, the Saudis would, would not independently try to agitate against it. The, you know, the Saudis have a different kind of problem. You know, the Israelis are concerned with the contents of the deal. They want to make sure that it, you know, prevents an Iranian nuclear weapon. Uh, the Saudis aren't terribly concerned with the contents of the deal. They're concerned that, that in order to get a deal, uh, we are prepared to give Iran 
essentially a hegemony in the region, that we will grant them a great influence in the region if they make concessions on the nuclear issue. That's what the Saudis most fear. And so they're going to judge the deal from, from a different uh, basis. I think that they fear two things. One is, is that the Iranians would, would implicitly get regional hegemony in a way that would be to their disadvantage. And the other somewhat related but still distinct point is I think a fear that the United States would naturally rather have a strong relationship with the Iranians like we had uh, for the, much of the 20th century and that their alliance would weaken and the, as the U.S.-Iranian alliance would strengthen that there would be a zero-sum dynamic and that would be distinctly to their disadvantage at a time when they, are, they remain, much as it causes them discomfort, uh, relying on a U.S. security guarantee. Um, as long as Iran's attitude towards Israel does not change, there is no way that the relations between the United States and Iran will go back to pre-revolutionary. And I don't see any change in that attitude towards Israel. So I don't think the Saudis should worry about that. Not this week. Not this week, <laughs> definitely. Um, I would love to bring you in. We have some wireless microphones. If you could just uh, wait for somebody to come. If you could do me a favor, follow my three rules. One is that you identify yourself. Second is that you only ask one question, and third is that you ask your question in the form of a question, which is not to make a statement and then ask our distinguished panelists, what do you think of my statement? A question right here. Uh, Steve Benson from uh, CSIS. I think about um, the complex, dangerous task of ridding uh, a region of thousands of tons of chemical weapons. Uh, and then I think about it in a conflict zone. And then I think about it with influence from Iran and troops and, for, and, and just influence, political influence. And I wonder about a potential misstep, another action of mass destruction in the area with chemical weapons. And I think about how Iran might have to be involved in the guarantee that that wouldn't happen. Is this something that plays on the negotiation table? Is this something that is within the thought process of the folks that are making these decisions? Uh, there's a lot of capital involved, political capital involved, in making sure this Syrian thing comes out right. I think if uh, Iran is seen to be supportive of the chemical disarmament of Syria, cooperating if it can cooperate, but being generally supportive, I think that's a positive factor. Uh, and I think uh, the Iranians do have motivation to be a positive factor. Uh, the Iranians clearly have a you know, concern about CW in the region. Iraq used chemical weapons against Iran during their war. And there are many, you know, there, there are, I don't know, tens of thousands of uh, Iranians who are still, you know, cons you know who are feeling the aftermath of, the, of that use. Uh, so I think they sincerely would like to see Bashar implement this deal uh, conscientiously. And I think, you know, to the extent that they're perceived as being supportive, I think it'll have a positive effect on people's perceptions of uh, Iran's willingness to implement a, a nuclear deal. Is there a question over there? Gentleman on the end. Mohammed Baharun from uh, Bahuth Center in Dubai. Uh, we're talking about uh, sanctions as if there one where well, there are three types of sanctions the UN the EU and the uh, US and if we assume that we're talking about the US sanctions uh, it already has got a sunset provision which says these sanctions would go away if Iran does one two three which begs the question why do we are, why are we talking about the deal if everything is 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 obvious and unless the deal actually requires compromise on both sides so where is that compromise is going to happen? And is it going to be related to the role Iran wants to play in the international community and the playground in which Iran is going to play on? Thank you. Did you hear the question? I didn't get it. You know, honestly, it was hard to hear with the sound. Exactly. Did you get it? Well? I didn't quite get it. 
It's, it's a brand new building, and we're still working on a few things. An, imp an imperfection in this building. Mm -hmm. Remarkable. There's also no red wine on the white marble, just so everybody knows. It would stain. Anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, the sanctions has got sunset provisions. Right. That says if Iran does this and this and that, the sanctions goes away. Right. Why is there a need for a deal if the provisions are very oh, okay. obvious? Okay, so the question is that this, the current round of the current legislation has a sunset provision at the end of 2016. And the question is can't the Iranians just wait out the clock and then in, on January 1st, 2017, all the sanctions go away? I don't. I don't think any of us think that's what would happen on January 1st, 2017. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that all of them sunset at that point. I think there's some that would continue. But uh, even if they were to sunset and the requirements for lifting them had not been met, I can guarantee that the U.S. Congress will adopt a new law that will extend those sanctions. I don't see there's any risk of that ever happening. The Iran Sanctions Act was, was a 1994 act, I believe, right? Think so. Yeah, but, but renewing it in the absence right. of the conditions exactly. that would enable it to be, you know, uh, ended would be hard to imagine. You know, I said earlier that the current effort to toughen sanctions, I don't th think will succeed. It won't succeed because it won't get to the floor. If it got to the floor and there was a vote, it would succeed. And the new sanctions won't expire. If there are new sanctions, they won't expire. In they won't put in the sunset provisions. <laughs> no. Definitely. Andrew Pierre, a uh, question for Ambassador Einhorn. Uh, Bob, you touched very briefly on the possibility of a division among the uh, P5 plus one. And uh, this has gotten really very little attention, it seems to me, in the public debate at least. And I'd like to get a sense of your sense of where the Russians and Chinese stand, uh, how anxious are they to have a deal? How would there possibly be a serious division between them and the Europeans? I'm going to assume for the moment that there wouldn't be between the Europeans and the United States. And then if the negotiations don't work out and this question of a, of a war, as to use the word of Al Hunt, but I would prefer to say a clean surgical strike against the uh, Iranian facilities, would, would that too become a major uh, factor of unraveling uh, among the P5 plus one? Um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I mean, so far, um, I think the U.S. administration has been very um, much impressed with the extent to which the Russians, Russians and Chinese have joined with the others in a unified position and putting pressure on the Iranians. Um, I think uh, probably uh, Russia's and China's uh, requirements for an acceptable deal are somewhat less you know, than U.S. requirements. I think uh, Russia and China would be prepared to settle for significantly less. Um, but if there was no deal um, and uh, uh, Iran were seen as the responsible party for the, for the stalemate, um, and, and we decided, or if anyone decided to use military force, uh, clearly Russia and China would not be on board. I, I, can, you know, I can, can't imagine Russia and China supporting the use of military force. I can imagine if they really believed uh, Iran was responsible for the impasse, uh, that they would acquiesce in uh, stronger sanctions. Uh, you know, Russia and China have not been advocates of sanctions, um, but uh, they've uh, mostly opposed sanctions that affected their own companies and, and their own persons. Uh, but the, I think they recognize, both of them, uh, that pressure has, what brought, uh, has, what has brought uh, Iran to the table so far. And if they were responsible for an impasse, I think they would go along with a further strengthening of, of sanctions. Uh, but um, we've, we've been impressed the extent to which Russian and Chinese diplomats have you know, supported uh, the collective efforts of the P5 plus one. And that's one reason Iran, I think, has become more serious about negotiations. Uh, Bob Kilpakin, uh, an independent uh, energy consultant. First of all, congratulations on the new building, John. Um, my question is for Mr. Einhorn. Uh, you talked about uh, a interim agreement versus a comprehensive one. 
And I'm frankly not, in my own mind, clear what the connection is between the two. Uh, you said that their program is a nuclear weapons program in suspended animation. Um, could you elucidate what the connection is and how we get from the interim to the comprehensive program? Yeah. I think the interim deal uh, would be, uh, I think there'd be two, two elements agreed in a framework. One would be an interim deal, putting interim constraints for about six months on Iran's program. The other would be the general outlines of a final deal that would be concluded at the same time as the details of the interim deal. The interim deal then would be implemented for about six months, during which time you would negotiate the details of the comprehensive arrangement. Why do you need these two parts? Why don't you go directly to a comprehensive deal? The reason is that would be a very detailed arrangement, the monitoring and all, all the rest, the constraints on an enrichment program. It would take a long time, a year or so, to negotiate, perhaps. Uh, in that time, Iran could make substantial progress on its nuclear program. I think they have, they're at the verge of making a substantial gain in their program. There are things they could do now that would really get them closer to a, the nuclear threshold. I think it's in our interest to have an interim deal immediately, very soon, that could cap that program, essentially freeze further progress while we're negotiating a comprehensive deal. And there's another reason for that. Um, we'll have to demonstrate, the administration will have to demonstrate to the Congress that Iran is prepared to live up to its obligations. I think if you put an interim deal in place while you, you, you but you still have not concluded a final deal, you have the opportunity during that period to demonstrate whether the Iranians are prepared to be conscientious. And if they are, if they're prepared to live up their, to their commitments, I think that's a much stronger argument that the administration can make for congressional approval of a final deal. So I think it, it, there's, a good re, there's a sound relationship between the two. And my, my understanding, just to clarify, my understanding is the interim deal essentially has them mothballing a lot of equipment, shutting a lot of equipment down in a verifiable way. So it represents a, a clear freezing and not just a treading water. Yeah. Uh, now there, um, no, you know, now, we, look, we have our own means, uh, intelligence means, to get a handle on, you know, whether they're pursuing covert program. And I think it's the view that, I mean, that w we are not aware of any covert activities. And I think even uh, intelligence communities like the Israelis doubt they're pursuing covert on the basis of their own national technical intelligence means. Uh, so we have a basis to do that now. In a final agreement, we'd have much more robust verification in place, and I think much greater confidence that they didn't have a covert program. But this would be a six-month period, a relatively short period. This gentleman over here. Thank you, Edward F. Georgetown University. I think it's worth asking, uh, who has time on its side in this situation? Um, clearly, Iran is hurting because of the sanctions, but if you look at it from our point of view, I mean, consider other controversial agreements, Law of the Sea, CTBT, New Start. Not only can the opponents say, we can live comfortably without this, they actually prefer a world without that agreement. Here, the situation is completely different. I don't think you can find anybody who would say the current situation is fine. Um, I mean, no agreement for us means more centrifuges, more enriched uranium, closer to a weapons capability, closer to war. Doesn't that make a difference in how the issue is posed here in Washington? I, I think one of the um, positive aspects of the current situation is that both sides seem to have an interest in early conclusion of a deal. I think it's fairly symmetrical, and that hasn't always been the case in you know, U.S.-Iranian history in terms of incentives for reaching any agreement. I think here, you're right, Ed, uh, you know, uh, we would like to see constraints put on that program soon. Uh, they would like to see sanctions eased. Um, on their economy soon. And I think that gives both sides uh, incentives for an early deal. Okay. Can I follow up on that and also on Bob's point? Is it catastrophic for either side if they judge the other side's intentions wrongly? That is, is it catastrophic for the Iranians 
if they misjudge the United States, and there's really no deal available, and it's a catastrophic for the United States if we misjudge the Iranians. I, I think it's, <clears throat> it's going to be catastrophic if they misjudge the United States because they have put so much on the table and their own reputation, their own survival. I mean, by their own, I mean this group, the negotiating team in this Iran. This is President Rouhani's team. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, Rouhani Zarif and his whole team. So it is going to be catastrophic, and some of them may not even survive. Have to. There would be a lot of pressure on them to resign and have a new team. And also the hardliners would say, well, we did tell you that the United States is not serious and so on. So that's how I definitely. But you have a team who is, who is quite aware of what the possibilities are. I don't know how sophisticated the Iranians are in looking at American politics. But if they are even reasonably sophisticated, they would conclude things ain't going to get a lot better. Uh, the next president is either going to be probably a Republican or Hillary Clinton, and if I'm them, I'm not going to say, boy, that'll be terrific, that'll be a lot better. And uh, I don't pretend to be sophisticated about Iran, and I don't know if, if, if Rouhani really is that, that Iranian moderate we've been looking for for 35 years, but it's pretty hard to imagine someone who'll be a lot better. Uh, so it seems to me that, it, that, that either side, that they make a calculation that and they misread, as John said, that things are going to get better, that that, that really would be a, a rather stupid miscalculation. So two more over here, and then finally there, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you. Uh, Bill Murray with Energy Intelligence Group. A slightly different question, uh, but this has to do with uh, a meeting taking place in Switzerland, I guess, during the past week concerning a uh, potential Middle East uh, nuclear free zone. And there was actually it's a bit below the table, but there was both. Uh, uh, Israeli and uh, Arab representatives there, although they may not have been talking, is that the administration is obviously cares about this a lot and is paying attention to this and maybe on a pushing uh, below the radar. Is this, how does this relate? Obviously it's tangential to the direct question, but it doesn't seem so since this is the Middle East and it's all in one uh, It wasn't just Israeli and Arab uh, uh, delegates there, there were Iranians there as well. Um, but uh, I think it is tangential to this uh, negotiation the, on the Iran nuclear issue. This is a long-standing proposal um, to uh, turn the Middle East into a zone free of all weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know, uh, Israel hasn't been enthusiastic about going forward with this uh, arrangement uh, as long as it doesn't have peace with all its neighbors and it has concerns about some of the nuclear weapons programs of its uh, neighbors. This has been ongoing since 1974 when the Egyptians and the Iranians jointly put this forward. Uh, at the NPT uh, conference in 2010, they called for, the NPT review conference, they called for a Middle East conference of regional states to, to negotiate this zone. There's no practical possibility that this is going to make any headway. And this has become a, a matter of uh, kind of you know, political theater. Uh, with um, a number of countries pointing the finger at Israel because of its nuclear program and trying to put it in the hot seat. The Israelis not wanting to, uh, to be put in the hot seat and refusing to have this uh, session. The Iranians, uh, even though uh, they've been uh, you know, accused by the IA Board of Governors of violating their you know, non-proliferation obligations, uh, are trying to, uh, you know, uh, you know, act as if they're the strongest supporter of this uh, Middle East zone. So it's, you know, it's a lot of political theater, but it's not going to result in uh, anything, and I would very much doubt there's going to be this conference anytime soon. Don't book tickets yet. <laughs> um, thanks so much, John. Uh, Chris Nelson, I'm an Asianist, so please forgive a really naive question. Uh, it relates to the, to, in a sense, the congressional and Israeli questions. Is it naive to say, you know, at a certain point to have a deal that is successful, implicitly there must be some opening for a rapprochement between Israel and Iran? That, uh, is it possible to talk about uh, you know, Israel-Egypt-style uh, working agreement 
uh, is that something that we should include? Because uh, as, as, as you guys were saying, uh, to get the Capitol Hill signed off, you know, the Israeli reaction, but also the, the Iranian existential threat question, it, it strikes me as, as essential to the messaging and the selling of the agreement. Should we be thinking in terms of of, of the, the Israeli-Iranian uh, conundrum as part of the nuclear deal? Because we haven't really talked about that. Thanks. Well, I would we defer to, to the two experts that I'm sure that would make it much easier <laughs> on Capitol Hill, but I, I, any, everything I've read suggests that's not going to happen. Uh, look, a, a, an Israeli-Iranian rapprochement would, uh, would guarantee support in Absolutely. the U.S. Congress. All right. But it's not going to happen, as Hala you know, pointed out. <laughs> oh, was it? It was a hopeful question. At least you didn't ask about unicorns. <laughs> um, thank, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much to our terrific panelists. Uh, I appreciate your coming. We look forward to seeing you for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.